Egypt, a country in which the present is haunted by the ghosts of the past, where the climate has conspired to preserve the artifacts of a civilization which began 7,000 years ago. To the West, it has always been the cradle of human civilization. But what of modern Egypt? What of the Islamic State that lies beyond the pyramids? Called by its Arab conquerors El Qahir, the victorious, Cairo is today threatened not by an invading army, but from the sheer number of its people. The mother of all cities is teetering on the edge of an abyss. Egypt's population of over 50 million increases by a staggering 1 million every 10 months. Despite its size, only 4% of Egypt's territory is habitable. Most of this is contained in the southern delta and the thin ribbon of irrigated land that straddles the Nile. The rest is desert. Consequently, Cairo has become the new mecca for internal immigration as the rural poor, the Felahim, continue to pour into the capital, now one of the most densely populated areas in the world. Inflamed by overpopulation and failed economic policies, the gap between rich and poor has grown even larger. But despite acute poverty, the spirit of the people is far from downtrodden. Unlike Western countries, where poverty is considered unacceptable and consequently breeds envy, in Egypt, with little hope of immediate change, poverty is a way of life and often perceived to be the will of God. Every Friday, the Islamic Sabbath, speakers call the faithful to the midday prayers. In the eyes of God, rich and poor are equal. The Prophet Muhammad taught, poverty is my pride, and for many deprived of material wealth, a powerful faith is the only way in which they can accept their social status with dignity. Despite being one of the most cosmopolitan and secular of all Arab cities, the vast majority of people remain deeply religious. Not everyone is keen to uphold the status quo. The fiery rhetoric of the sheikhs is often as political as it is religious or moral in tone. The growth in population has led to increased competition over resources and the resulting social tensions have been key factors in the rise of Islamic fundamentalism. The current president, Hosni Mubarak, has inherited a political nightmare. He finds himself caught between two opposing ideologies, President Nasser's socialist infrastructure created in the 60s and Sadat's open-door policies which expose Egypt to the rigors of the free market. The resulting economic deadlock has left the government with a crippling $50 billion foreign debt, forcing the country to abandon its Soviet-style food subsidies. Despite these harsh economic realities, life in the old part of Cairo, set amongst the domes and minarets of the ancient mosques, has changed little. In the maze of narrow streets, the noise of the motor car is replaced by the clamor of trade. Cairo is famous throughout the Islamic world for its numerous mosques, several of which house the shrines of the Prophet's descendants, such as the mosque of Sidna Hussein. 
Hussein was the martyred grandson of the Prophet, and this mosque is one of the most sacred sites in Islam. Opposite this, and dominating the northern skyline, is one of Cairo's favorite tourist attractions, the Mosque of Muhammad Ali, the despotic Pasha of Egypt. Near this mosque is an area less frequented by tourists, known as the City of the Dead. It stretches for miles and contains the tombs of some of Cairo's most famous rulers. Yet this necropolis is not inhabited by the dead alone. Due to the chronic shortage of housing, it is home to over 40,000 living tenants. There is a tradition in Egypt that if you can afford it, you should bury your dead in a sarcophagus, upon which is built a small house to accommodate the dear departed's frequent visitors. Consequently, row after row of mausoleums have become squatted by families in need of shelter. This man Mohammed was forced to move here after his house collapsed. He lives here with his wife and children in a shelter built by his ancestors. It is a good arrangement. The dead are unlikely to be forgotten. Mohammed's bed rests upon the tombstone of his grandfather. Also in the city of the dead is the mosque of Saida Nefisa. Nafisa was the granddaughter of the Prophet and, being of his blood, she is revered by the Islamic world as a saint. All around the mosque, several hundred men are preparing for the Mulid of Sayyida Nafisa. Mulids are of central importance to the popular expression of Islam and usually mark the symbolic birthday of the Awliya people considered to be favorites or friends of God. Scaffolding is erected, over which brightly colored fabrics are draped. These tents will house the thousands who have traveled from all over the country to participate in a celebration that is both spiritual and secular. Electricians work with long strings of colored bulbs gradually building up an elaborate pattern of illuminated decorations the length and breadth of the mosque. After two weeks, on the eve of the festivities, everything has been prepared. Only a few last-minute details remain. The new moon, star and crescent, symbol of Islam, mark the beginning of the Mulid. As night falls, the illuminations are switched on and from a distance the mosque is transformed. A fairground for the faithful. The cult of saint worship stretches back to the early days of Islam. Many of these saints belong to the mystical Islamic tradition known as Sufism. The word Sufi probably derives from the Arabic Suf, meaning wool, referring to the coarse woolen garments worn by these early mystics. The sanctification of poverty by Sufis and its emphasis on individual cultivation of spiritual knowledge ensured that it enjoyed enormous popularity amongst the poorer sections of the community. Inevitably, the claims of the Sufis brought them into conflict with the ulma, the learned scholars and protectors of Islamic law. The quest for the Absolute is illustrated by the masters of Sufism with the radius of a circle. The circumference depicts Islamic law, simple but rigid. In order to be a good Muslim, it suffices to obey. On the other hand, the radius depicts the long and hard learning within, which only a few will be able to undertake to obtain the vision of God, Hakika. The first Sufis believed the Qur'an contained a hidden or esoteric meaning, which, if deciphered, revealed this supreme truth. Thus, through the centuries, novel mystic movements emerged in different parts of Islam, each with its own form of meditation or path to God, known as Tariqa. The word Tariqa is also used to describe the different Sufi orders. These spiritual brotherhoods claim to trace their origins back along a chain of initiation to the Prophet himself. The great Sufi tariqas of Egypt, the Shazliya, 
Ahmadiyya and Rifai pictured here, distinguished themselves outwardly by using different colored banners and clothing, and inwardly by their different techniques for spiritual transcendence. The most common technique for spiritual transcendence is called a zikr. To an outsider, the devotees may look like people in a state of trance. While some do indeed succumb to trance and hysteria, most describe the experience as a joyful and highly conscious state, an inner clarity derived from concentrated repetition of the name of God. This 19th century lithograph illustrates the unsympathetic attitude held in the West towards this Islamic tradition. It speaks more of religious fanaticism than religious ecstasy. Sex, violence and fanaticism have dominated the European image of the Islamic world. The rise of fundamentalism has done little to change these historically ingrained assumptions. The carnival atmosphere generated at Moulids, which celebrate the act of sharing in communal meals, music and singing, are a marked contrast to the austere and threatening images which have become the hallmark of extreme fundamentalism. Families and Sufi groups, many who have traveled great distances on this pilgrimage to the saint's shrine, begin to converge around the mosque. For the next few days and nights, these tent-like shelters will be home. There is a political as well as religious function to the festivities. In the past, the government, uncomfortable with many of the activities at Mulids, consistently attempted to reduce their sphere of influence. Today, it is the fundamentalists who want to ban these festivals, which contravene Islamic law. Consequently, the authorities are now keen to promote the survival of Mulids, which, as well as providing a sense of community and an ecstatic release from day-to-day -day poverty, also ensure that a large section of the community remain impervious to the lures of the fundamentalists. An essential part of Mulids in Upper Egypt is a ritual form of combat using long wooden staffs. This mock form of fighting, called Tatib, is more like a dance than true combat and has been handed down through the millennia from pharaonic times. Generosity and hospitality are natural characteristics of Arab people, but such virtues are especially evident on these occasions, since it is felt that a gift on behalf of the saint made to a stranger or a friend is also a gift to God. Tents are open to anyone who wishes a simple meal. 
Throughout the day, people will drift between gatherings, drinking tea and coffee, talking, or just sitting in the presence of the sheikh. At the end of the meal, they may stay to listen to ballads, praising the life of the saint or recitations from the Quran. Om Ahmad has acquired the title of Sheikha. She belongs to the Refai Tariqa. Every year she travels 40 miles to attend this festival. Why does she keep coming? The Tariqa is beautiful. The Mulet is a very beautiful thing. We come to see people, we see our friends, and we serve people. All of this makes us very happy. Some clean, some sweep, some cook, but all together. It's a wonderful, joyous time. At the Mulid, we get a beautiful sense of sustenance from God. It's something we are attracted to. It's a time to be with the devotees of the house of the Prophet. It's beautiful, and we feel so happy. We reach wonderful things in the Mulid. Islam is good and beautiful. If I were drunk, I could not express my feelings in a more ecstatic way. <laughs> this bull, belonging to a rich man, has been presented as a votive offering. Half the meat is divided between the sheikh and the butcher the rest being distributed amongst the poor. This sacrifice is a form of petition made to God via the saint. Frequently, the request concerns the desire for a child or the settlement of some dispute. A saint, if deceased, is considered to be closer to the divine and thought to be more fully charged with supernatural influence than when he was alive. From a distant part of Cairo, the great Sufi orders parade together on the long march to the mosque. This procession, called a zifa, is an opportunity for the Tariqas to parade their banners in a display of solidarity and allegiance to the saint. On this occasion, the sheikh, who is carrying a relic of the saint, is led through the streets on horseback. Tambourines played to accompany the whirling dance of the people of Abu Gate announce his arrival to the crowds who press forward to try to receive his blessings. Fairground activities form an integral part of any mulid providing entertainment for the children. And the adults.
Meanwhile, different Sufi brotherhoods continue to arrive. As people ascend the steps to the mosque, a zikr is underway. The motive behind any visit is to receive the baraka of the holy person. Baraka is considered as a mysterious supernatural force and is seen as a blessing from God. Shrines are usually built around the actual body or some relic of the saint. It is believed that these remains form the focus from which baraka emanates. Following the processions and the zikr in the mosque, the faithful pour into the shrine room, shouting praises to the saint and the prophet, rubbing their hands or a piece of clothing on the brass ornaments in order to facilitate the absorption of baraka. Besides rubbing the shrine, baraka can be received from eau de cologne sprinkled on the crowds, or in sweets, often dispersed after a zikr, as well as from water, which is distributed by servants of the mosque. Sheikh Said Abdul Rahman has been practicing Sufism in the Bayumi Tariqa for over 30 years since he was 13. He explains his understanding of baraka. A mulid is an assembly of Islam where I can meet my various friends and brothers in a group all together. It is an opportunity for me to give something to my friend and in return he will give me something. If I am ill and he is not, his presence can alleviate the sickness that I feel. Islam provides food for the spirit, and from this idea the concept of barakah arose, because a man who possesses barakah is one whose spirit is very rich and therefore has grace from God. In a mulid, people come to be closer to a man who has this grace from God, and through this process they too can get closer to God. If someone has more barakah, he can give it to someone who has less. It is a kind of spiritual energy. Through prayer or spiritual intention, God will bless them and give them some divine grace. I am a poor man, therefore God gives me grace. As evening progresses, various sickers are taking place in the tents, the back streets, here outside the mosque, as well as inside. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Sheikh Abdel Mordi, who is a member of the Ahmadiyya Tariqa, is also a munshid, or a singer, who accompanies the zikr. He describes the zikr by saying, Zikr is my inner food. It's like the water that irrigates the field. The field becomes alive through the water, so I too come alive with the zikr. With the zikr of God, we wish to be reborn and revived. In front of the mosque, crowds have gathered to witness a contest of skills. Like the stick fights, this equestrian performance, called the Mirma, has no winners. The display is to show off the talents of the riders in their control over the horses. A hundred years ago, horses were put to a very different purpose in a religious ceremony called the Dosa. This 19th century eyewitness account describes what the faithful had to endure. Here, a considerable number of the devotees laid themselves upon the ground with their arms placed beneath their foreheads, whilst incessantly chanting the word Allah. Finally, the sheikh approached, his horse hesitating for several minutes to tread upon the backs of the prostrate men, but being urged on, eventually ambled with high pace over them. The spectators immediately raised a cry of Allah, Allah. Not one of the men seemed to be hurt. Since the moment the animal had passed over him, he leapt up and began to follow the sheikh. Today this form of dosa has completely disappeared. Extreme displays of faith are less common, but can still be seen amongst the Rafai Tariqa, who pierce their bodies with swords and skewers, calling upon the intercession of the saint to prevent pain or injury. The zikr may last for many hours without rest. For some, the rhythmic swaying, hypnotic music and hyperventilated breathing combine to produce a state of extreme excitement, characterized by jerking limbs and frothing at the mouth. This state, perceived as a form of divine possession, called melbuz, is treated with respect. Those in the thrall of possession are held firmly to prevent them hurting themselves. Near this scene of religious ecstasy, magic of a more conventional nature is being performed. Many of the religious rituals at Mulids derive from Sufi traditions, but those participating do not call themselves Sufis. Instead, they refer to themselves as devotees of the House of the Prophet, or in some cases, Darwish, from which we get the English Dervish. In Turkish, it means threshold, referring to one who is on the threshold of rapture. Said explains its Egyptian derivation. A Darwish is someone who has turned his back on worldly matters. He is a mendicant, someone who is poor, but poor only in worldly needs. His aspirations are for the other world. Darwish comes from the Egyptian dar, meaning to turn round, and wish, meaning face. So a darwish is one who has turned his face from the world. So this is the sign for the zikr. Breath is the key to many spiritual exercises, and throughout the centuries, Sufis have developed their own distinctive techniques. I remember God from the heart, and when we zikr, we go... But other tariqas have a different way. They say...
Each Tariqa has its own technique. But in a zikr, one does not have to use words. You need only mention God in silence, inside your heart. This is more sublime. Even in this tiny back street, an impromptu zikr is in progress. Inside the house, the women are listening. From a Western perspective, the holy law of Islam seems to assert the superiority of men over women. In the last 50 years, attitudes have changed considerably, though this emancipation has only affected the well-educated. In contrast, the majority attending mulids observe the traditional Islamic values concerning the status of women. The zikr, however, offers an exceptional occasion not found in any other religious context for men and women to participate together. All other religious practice is segregated. On the final night, the Leila Kabira, the faithful are carried once more on a crest of devotion to demonstrate their endurance and love of God. Exhausted after days of intense activity, many will sleep wherever they find space. The music, interwoven with the rhythmic sounds of God's name, will continue until dawn to rise here and there from within the maze of narrow streets surrounding the mosque. Until next year, the birthday feast of Nafisa is over. The celebrations have run their course. 
Yet for those devoted dervish who attend all the major mulids, the wait for the next will not be long. The Egyptian calendar is crammed with mulids, Islamic and Coptic, all celebrating the lives and works of saints, both famous and obscure. The activities at Mulids have changed little in a tradition that stretches back to the dawn of Islam. A celebration of generosity, of love of life, and a firm belief in the intervention of the supernatural in the daily round. For many Mulid goers, the material deprivation of earthly life is amply compensated for by the rich web of belief that surrounds the cult of saints. Zikr means to remember God. It means we roam around with the angels. We are genuflecting to our sublime master. We're not outside. We don't know what's outside. We're inside. Do you see what's outside now? No, we're inside. When we perform Zikr, we go around with these angels and we encircle the holy Kaaba in their company. It stabilizes our spirits and purifies them. Take away all the silly, frivolous things and let me be pure. This is Zikr.